recording. Check one, check one, two. All right, everyone, welcome to day two of Ohio Linux Fest, uh, the 13th Ohio Linux Fest. So it's a, uh, going to be another great day. I'm really excited for today. Uh, it, it looks like registration has been going smoothly and folks have been working on this for over nine months. It, it's interesting. I, it, by the time we're done with conference, I, at least personally, I, I'm typically about to fall over. So we usually take two to six week, weeks break in between and then we're back to planning the next conference. So it's great to see everything come to fruition. Thank you for coming. I'm really excited for today, and if you need anything, uh, look for folks uh, with one of these badges on, and we'll be happy to help. I'm really, really excited for our keynote today. It's not often that we get to do an interview-style keynote address, so it, it should be really fun. And now I'd like to hand over to our uh, one of our uh, board members here, Beth Lynn, who is going to be uh, introducing our keynote. to the Ohio Linux Fest. I'm proud to introduce Ms. Valerie Aurora. She is the co-founder and interim executive director of the ADA Initiative, a nonprofit organization which helps get and stay women involved in open source in similar areas. Valerie is experienced open source engineer and was the leading file systems developer, researcher, and consultant for over a decade. She invented several new file systems concepts such as the Relative A Time, co-founded Linux Storage File Systems, Memory Management Summit. Valerie has also been working to increase the overall participation of women in open uh, source and open culture projects for over 15 years. She was a member of the first international Linux group, Linux Chicks, and wrote the How to Encourage Women in Linux, translated in over 13 languages. She was also a contributor to Geek Feminism Wiki and Blog. She was led to be the author of the Adian Initiative Examples for Conference Anti-Harassment Policies. Now in use by hundreds of conferences both in and out of tech. She has created and teaches the Ally Skills Workshop, which teaches men simple ways to support women in open source technology and culture. She was also the recipient of the O'Reilly Open Source Award in 2016. It's our privilege to have her here at our event. Everyone, Ms. Valerie. questions for Valerie here and what I'm going to ask you all to do is take the, the note card and the, the pencil around your seat and if a question occurs to you uh, within the next 15 minutes please write it down and we will have a volunteer come and collect it. Thank you very much. Barry, you might not know this, but it, you and I, our careers have um, mixed paths quite a bit. Uh, the fir very first time was in 1999. I actually had a Linux chips <coughs> profile too. Oh, oh and um, that, that's the, the first time that, that I saw you and I 
always looked up to you and admired you, and I'm very so thrilled to have you on the stage today. So welcome. Well, Beth, Beth Lynn, I just wanted to say um, I never imagined that I would have the honor of actually getting to work with you in person and come here to Ohio Linux Fest. And I just want to say that um, uh, a good part of the reason why Ohio Linux Fest is so highly regarded and so popular and still going after all these years is your incredible hard work. So, thank you. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Awesome. And it was at 1999 I was starting to get involved with Linux and my user group just was very supportive. However, they were very apologetic that there weren't a lot of women involved and that's how I got involved with Linux Chicks too. So Valerie, how did you first get involved with Linux? Yeah, uh, so I was incredibly lucky. Uh, I was in, uh, in 1995, I went to university at this little tiny college in New Mexico called New Mexico Tech, originally New Mexico Mining and, uh, Institute of Mining and Technology, but they dropped the mining. So, <laughs> um, and I, I was lucky there that there were two Linux kernel developers working on the PowerPC platform who were uh, uh, teaching at the college at that time. Uh, and it turns out that I have another connection with Ohio Linux Fest because um, John Mad Dog Hall got DEC to donate an alpha machine to my university's computer science department. And so my first operating system project was create, uh, implementing soft interrupt handling on the alpha, architect, uh, alpha architecture for Linux. Um, so yeah, just really lucky. Really? Because, you know, the first distro that I used back in 1999, which actually got me into a user group setting, was the alpha port of Red Hat Linux. And okay. back in those days, a browser was not available for that port. And I, I was trying to, to compile Mozilla on my own. And, well, it compiled yeah. really quickly, I'm sure. <laughs> Before it had it there. <laughs> well, it, it was just right in the days that they had released the code. That, that's how it went. So, um, all right. So, I, I gotta ask, well, what was your first distro? Uh, yeah, so um, I, it was 1996, so obviously I was probably running Slackware on a pile of floppies, and indeed I was. Um, yeah, and so I moved on to, I think Mandrake actually, for some reason, was my next distribution, uh, and then I started using Red Hat. Uh, and then, as soon as I discovered Debian apt, and, and how much better it was than downloading random RPMs off the internet forever and ever and ever. Uh, I switched to Debian. Uh, I used Ubuntu for a while. Uh, and unfortunately, I eventually got tired of being a systems administrator. Uh, I can do it, but I don't want to. So these days I run uh, OS X on Linux because then I can still use my shell. Um, but for some reason, uh, oh, sorry, OS X on um, uh, Macs. Uh, for some reason, I, at some point, it always becomes necessary for me to install Linux on my Mac anyway. So, uh, I've written a few uh, instructions for how to install Linux on a recent Mac that um, involve very terrible hacks. So. Well, um, I uh, was going back and forth through various uh, platforms back in 1999 and even today, so I, I definitely appreciate that. Uh, back then, I was going back and forth between um, the proprietary, now defunct, operating system of Irix and to the um, GNU Linux on Alpha. And what was always there for me was VI. All right, so, I, I, and that's why I am VI forever. <laughs> what about you? Well, now that you throw another gun on it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, an interesting thing about New Mexico Tech is that um, there is a group of people who were acknowledged to be the best computer programmers in the university. They were called SysProgs for systems programmers. They worked at the computer center. I was a lowly user consultant. Uh, but they all used Emacs. And so what people would do when they were teaching our computer science classes is they would make us all copy the SysProgs.emacs configuration files. Uh, and I went and looked at my .emacs before this uh, interview discovered that there was a comment in there from 1994 from one of my sysprogs <laughs> still. So, um, so yeah, I know enough VI to edit Etsy files and, uh, uh, you know, just in case I'm 
logged into a computer that's not attached to the network, so I can't download Emacs. Uh, I got my start in research computing too. It was actually an internship at Pittsburgh Supercomputing that brought me to the, the GNU Linux operating system, and it's been a really fun time ever since. But, but wow, you, you really dug into it with all the file systems work. And, and you even did ZFS on Solaris. My goodness, what a trick. And um, also, of course, EXT3 uh, and the AXT4 and Union Mounts, and then there was something called ChunkFS? <laughs> so yeah, I named the file system ChunkFS. Uh, yeah, you should, you should never let me name things. It's a terrible <laughs> idea. <laughs> All right, so tell us a little bit of the relative A time and how you use some feminist principles to come up with a solution to architect this classic Unix file systems problem. Ooh, classic, I like the word. Okay, yeah, so this is an interesting combination of technical file system stuff and um, a feminism, which uh, of course made everyone at Hacker News very angry when I wrote about it. So, uh, <laughs> So to, to understand uh, what I did, the first thing you need to know about is a little bit of technical background. So in Unix, uh, files have uh, three timestamps. Um, one of them is the last time the file was read. Uh, that's called A time. The next one is the last time a file was uh, written. That's called uh, M time. And the third one is called C time, and it's impossible to explain without getting it wrong. Don't worry about it. So, um, <laughs> the important thing is that you know that um, uh, files in Unix have these have a, a timestamp that's stored on disk that says when the file was last read and when it was last written. So, um, the thing about writing to disks is that it's really slow. Uh, and especially, it's especially slow if you're writing a tiny bit randomly somewhere located anywhere on the drive. Uh, so most of the world's data is still on spinning disks. Sure, your laptop has an SSD, but all of that data you use in the cloud, the magical cloud, is on a spinning disk, and it's slow to do writes on that. Um, so the thing about that that is frustrating about this is that uh, in the best case, when you're doing a read, the, re the data you're reading is cached in memory, because you've recently uh, read it, it's still sitting there. All it is is a memory, ask, that's a memory um, access. That's really fast. The bad part is because Unix decided you want to track the last time that you read a file. Every time you read it, even if it satisfies it in the ca memory cache of the machine, it goes out and writes to the disk. Uh, so you can do have a whole lot of really efficient reads, and then for some reason your disk is thrashing and thrashing and going really slowly, right? So a bunch of file systems developers have been trying to fix this since pretty much 1969. Uh, <laughs> and they usually took this very technical approach of like, what if we chain together the inodes and then we delay the writing out and blah, 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 right? And it was all very working at the level of inside the file system. Um, and so what actually, despite all of the smart people all thinking, uh, the best solution at the time, I think it was 2005 or something like that, was to turn off all A time updates. So just don't track the last time that a file system was read. Uh, and anyone who was running a server or wanted their laptop to go really fast would turn off uh, A time. Uh, so a bunch of my friends in Linux Jix, that women in Linux group that Beth and I discovered each other in so long ago, uh, were at, talking about file systems performance and why their laptop was so slow. And I told them, oh, just turn off A time. Uh, and one of my friends said, oh, great, Val, but when I turned off A time, uh, Mutt stopped telling me that there was new mail. Uh, this is my friend Akana. Uh, and the thing is, is that in Linux Jix, the purpose of Linux Jix was to create a place where we could have technical discussions safely where no one would make fun of you or mock you. Uh, and so my friend Akana would never have written that on, I don't know, the Linux kernel mailing list, right? <laughs> so a bunch of people told her how foolish she was and that she really needed to install this new patch to Mutt, blah, 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 blah. Um, so I started thinking about this, and I realized that what Mutt wanted to know was, has new e email been written to this file since the last time I read it? It, was, it didn't want to know when was the last time I read it. It wanted to know, has this file been read since it was last written? And that's when I had the idea of, oh, what if we just update the, the A time if it is after the last written time, <coughs> relative A time. So uh, update the A time relative to the last written time. 
Uh, so I hacked it up in, I don't know, a few minutes. It's not a very complicated uh, piece of code. Um, and then uh, we tested it on a whole bunch of uh, different people's computers. A bunch of distros used it in their experimental versions. And it turned out that all we had to do was add one more piece of code, which said to update the last run time every 24 hours. Uh, because there's a temp watcher, there's things that delete files that they haven't been used for a while. Once we added that piece of code, it worked so well, it didn't break any applications, uh, that people, that it was turned on as the default. It's like in the kernel, that's the default option. All of the distros ship with relative A time turned on. Um, so yeah, I, uh, instead of telling my friend that she was technically an idiot and she should just suck it up and deal with it, I, I got creative and understood that, that this was what the application actually wanted to do. Uh, and I have to note that this was another poor uh, naming decision on my part. Uh, the mount option is R-E-L-A time, which looks like a misspelling of real time. <laughs> Don't let me name things. So. so yes, that's how feminism helped me sol solve one of the oldest problems in Unix. Well, you, you seem to have some unusual and strong opinions <laughs> as to how file system developers should work with users. Do you think file system developers should do something else to support the Linux user base? Yeah, I have, I have different and strange opinions <laughs> about uh, working with the people who use the kernel and who use file systems in particular. Um, so this is another somewhat technical story. Uh, there's an article on Linux Weekly News about it, if you want to read about it. Uh, that one uh, also was very popular, but didn't make people angry. So there you go. Uh, <laughs> darn. Well, I'm sure it made some people angry. But, uh, so the the you might remember uh, this as the O ponies argument. O with ponies. Yeah. Uh, so there's this problem back in 2009 when. Well, uh, Linus Torvalds got tired of his laptop going so slowly and decided to, that he wanted the unsafe fast option of ext3 to be the default. So this writes out data in such a way that if the computer crashes, when the computer comes back up, the file that you were writing at the time of the crash might be filled with garbage, or it might be all zeros, or it might contain the contents of slash, slash etsy shadow, <coughs> or <laughs> the file where you keep all of your angry thoughts about all of the other people who use your system, right? It's not safe, but Linus Torvalds decided that you know it was his laptop and he didn't care and everyone else who needed a safe file system uh, could just uh, change the default uh, mount option. So that was somewhat annoying. Uh, what happened next is even more annoying. Um, so this it was sort of gratuitously bad that this happened when a crash happened with this mount, this particular style of mount. Um, the ext3 maintainer, Ted Cho, decided at first not to fix this problem at all uh, and just to uh, instead make fun of application developers who wanted to use their file system uh, in a way uh, <laughs> that didn't end up with file garbage in their data files um, when they restarted. In particular, the problem that was happening a lot is that people wanted to update the contents of a file uh, atomically. Either all the new data is there, or none of the new data is there. Um, this is something you want to do a lot. And a really safe way to do that is to create a new file, put in all the new data in there, and then rename it over the old file, right? Uh, and this worked like a charm. Either you would get the old file, and it was perfectly consistent, or you would get the new file, and it was perfectly consistent, too. What happened with the new world and the new uh, default is that that new file could, uh, could have garbage in it, could have data, could have zeros, could have the contents of your password file, right? Um, <laughs> so uh, Ted wanted to fix this by calling fsync after a rename. He said, oh, well, rename doesn't have that behavior. It's not defined by POSIX. It's merely you know, logical. <laughs> uh, so call fsync. Now, the problem with fsync is that it's very slow. Uh, and it's extreme, even slower on ext3 because it requires every single write that was queued to the file system at that time to complete before it comes back. And so if you called fsync when some other activity was going on, it, took, it could take several seconds uh, to come back. And a bunch of, uh, again, applications developers said, uh, that's totally unacceptable. I can't have it take three seconds for people to move a window, right? 
So um, people started joking about this and calling this the O ponies option to open, the open systems, systems call, and pretending like asking for a rename that either, either gave you the old data or the new data was, was like a little kid asking for a pony at Christmas, right? Like, you got to have a pony. Ah, file systems are just not that reliable. So the thing that I really remember about this argument was uh, at one point, um, uh, Ted Cho was making fun of a woman who played Tux Racer on her desktop. I believe it was KDE. And the thing that she would do is she would start up KDE and she would rearrange all of her windows into the, just the right configuration so that she could see everything. Um, and then KDE would try to save that configuration uh, using reading. Uh, and then she would start running Tux, Tux Racer, uh, which I don't know. How many here have run, played Tux Racer? Yeah, right? Uh, unfortunately, she had a buggy video driver, and sometimes it would crash the computer within, I don't know, a minute or something like that, of uh, starting Tux Racer. And whenever that happened, all of her configuration files would get full of garbage, and she'd start up KDE again, and her windows wouldn't be in the right place. Uh, and uh, this person jumped on this as a totally unreasonable thing to expect. Look how trivial your, your ideas are. And, uh, how. I can't believe you want to use my file system to save your window locations, right? <laughs> um, and I thought that was really obnoxious. Um, I really think that uh, uh, just because it's, some, it's hard to implement something, some sort of data guarantee in the file system, that's not a good reason not to do it. Uh, so eventually, uh, he had to back down and actually fix some of the bugs that were causing this behavior to happen. Um, but I spent a lot, of, a lot of my articles from Linux Weekly News are basically advocating against this kind of, uh, this kind of attitude. So, uh, I'm on the side of the people who are using the file system, because that's almost everyone. There's only like 12 of us actually writing the file system, so. Oh, well, thank you for standing up for the users, not only the users, but, but the desktop users and the new desktop users, and a, even the game players, because everybody has to yeah, start so somewhere um, <laughs> for the, um, their All right. experience. Who got excited about computers because they played games on them? Right, yes, okay. <laughs> well, I, I, absolutely, thanks for, for doing the, that poll. Um, but what what is really my passion is the, the desktop experience, especially yes. for, for the children. And um, uh, one of the people who are in the audience today is, um, was my mentor, Dave Stevick, who we, we went to Ghana with Computer Reach three years ago, and he's going to give a presentation about that later on today. Awesome. And even though I wasn't paid, that was most definitely my dream job, my dream experience. And I, it's just been a remarkable journey as to where free software is taking me. But in, in um, uh, 2008, you were working for, for Red Hat as a systems developer. How cool is that? How, what is that like? <laughs> so it was funny because when I started working on Linux, um, <coughs> working for Red Hat as a kernel developer was just out, um, out of the question. I couldn't imagine ever being that good, right? Uh, so it was really exciting to me to get a chance to work for Red Hat. And it was actually as good as I thought it was going to be. A lot of that is because uh, my boss is, was uh, Rick Wheeler, who's this fantastic guy. If you ever get a chance to work with him, do it immediately. Uh, I got to work on upstream stuff. Uh, I got to work four days a week, which was really nice for most of the time I worked there. So um, the big things I worked on there was uh, the 64-bit user land support for uh, ext 4 uh, and union mounts, So, uh, which was one of the many file systems that preceded the overlay FS, which is now the in kernel uh, stacking system that you should be using. So it was a really good job. Uh, well, okay. So why did you leave if it was so uh, fantastic? Yeah, it was really hard. I spent a lot of time wondering why, you know, what's wrong with me that I'm considering this. Um, so actually, uh, I had been working since uh, for the previous decade to that about um, to get more women involved in Linux, right? Uh, so I started with Linux Chicks and then I started working on geek feminism. Uh, and then uh, I was working at Red Hat, and a friend of mine, it was about five years ago, uh, got groped for the third time in one year at an open source conference. And I just couldn't take it anymore. I, I, really, I remembered, uh, wow, I was groped at a conference twice, including one of the conferences I started. 
Uh, and I just, I just couldn't anymore in good conscience encourage women to go into a field where I knew that they could be physically assaulted if they went to a conference. So I either had to stop getting women involved in Linux, um, or I had to fix it. That's how I felt. So um, I, I decided that I was going to write an example of conference anti-harassment policy with the help of a bunch of other folks, including Beth Lynn, uh, and my uh, future co-founder, you'll hear about that in a minute, uh, Mary Gardner. Uh, and so we, did, we wrote this anti-harassment policy that um, is now in use by hundreds or thousands of conferences, including entomology conferences. It's really amazing. <laughs> There's even a, some kind of a band that has a code of conduct for their shows. Um, so yeah, I told my boss, Rick Wheeler, that I was going to do work on this for the next few weeks. He said, great, go for it. Red Hat supports you the whole way. Uh, and it was really successful. We launched it. A whole bunch of organizations developed, uh, adopted it right away, including Ohio Linux Fest. Uh, and I decided that since it was so successful, I was going to go ahead and try to work on this full time, uh, making open source software more accessible to women. Uh, I didn't know how I was going to fund it. <laughs> it took about eight months before I started collecting a salary again. But um, yeah, we started. I decided to. Uh, I got Mary Gardner to co-found co -found with me, and she is responsible for the good name, the Ada Initiative, <laughs> named after Ada Lovelace, the world's first computer programmer. Uh, although many people think it's ADA an acronym, so or that we're in favor of uh, the ADA programming language, which <laughs> I did actually write for about six months. So, uh, yeah. Well, e, you've had some opportunity through the ADA initiative to uh, schedule some events. Can you tell us uh, about the ADA camp and the unconferences that that right. initiative has presented? Sure. Um, so the Ada Camp on, on Conference is a women-only conference of about 30 to 200 people for women involved in open technology and culture. So that includes things like open source software, but also uh, a Wikipedia uh, fan culture, open uh, geo stuff, things like that. Uh, and we pioneered a lot of interesting things there. Um, so we created, uh, well, we borrowed or created uh, the Quiet Room, a place where you can go and just be quiet. People aren't supposed to talk. Uh, we did a really good job of making sure everyone's food needs were met. It's a conference, many people actually get to eat at the conference when they have strange uh, food requirements. Uh, we had a big focus on making sure every, all the conferences are ex uh, accessible to people who were in mobility devices or um, were vision impaired. Uh, we did a lot of things like that. And as a result, uh, a lot of women called this conference uh, life-changing. <laughs> I wish I was making, uh, if I was making it up, I would ask people to say it. Ada Camp was life changing, but they did it without me even asking, so great. Uh, so, what's more really important, oh, yes, and childcare. Uh, conference childcare is really important too. What's really great is that we're seeing a lot of these innovations at other conferences now, like uh, the Linux Foundation conferences, PyCon, stuff like that. Well, excellent. I, I also want to thank you for leading the Ally Skills Workshop yesterday and uh, took part in it. And it was uh, absolutely excellent experience for, for everyone involved. Now, this uh, teached men how to support women in open source in other areas. People usually focus on teaching women differently. What inspired you to put together this workshop? Well, so uh, I'm a systems programmer, and so I know that it doesn't make sense to optimize the, the, the part of the code that's only taking up 2% of the time executing. Mm -hmm. You should probably look at the part of the code that's taking up 98% of the time. So similarly, there is a, a, a survey in 2006 that showed that open source software was about 98% men. And I just realized, wow, we're not going to change anything unless we're getting men involved in changing the culture. So I saw a similar workshop at Grace Hopper Celebration taught by Carolyn Samard, who's an amazing researcher in this area, uh, in which people role played out scenarios in which they could take specific action to support women. Um, I discovered that most operating uh, uh, open source folks were too shy to role play, <laughs> so I changed it to a discussion format, and uh, we we spend a lot of time uh, discussing how we might respond in a situation, and that way we get a lot more um, uh, a lot more uh, uh, different uh, approaches to the problem, and people get a better understanding. Um, yeah, it's a it's been taught. It's now at Google. Uh, they've adopted it internally. Uh, it's called called uh, bias busters. 
They've taught it to over 2,000 people. I've taught uh, 40 workshops myself, um, and I've also trained 40 other people to teach this workshop. 